Welcome to another edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast. Uh, the legend Dino is in situ in Rio de Janeiro. Hello, Tim. Hello, and we can welcome back to the Five and Dime one more time. Come on down, Jimmy D, Jimmy D. <laughs> yes, indeed. Not that Jimmy D. Yeah. The other one, you mean James Dixon, don't you? Yeah, Which I mean a rebel fixed? with a rebel with a cause. That's the difference. Oh, I like that. I like, and, and with a beard, unlike the other Jimmy Dean. And a giant as well. Well, as for you to say, I'll reserve my judgment on that. Hello, James. I didn't know you were listening. Nice to be talked about, isn't it? Well, uh, well nice to be welcomed back there. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, looking forward to this one. Yeah, as I say, author of uh, The Fix, how the Champions League was won and how we lost, yeah? It's approximately right, so that's fine. Yeah, well, <laughs> correct me, correct me. Uh, how the how the first Champions League was won and why we all lost, and um, yeah, although this this uh, episode or not episode this fixture that we're going to discuss is a little bit beyond the very first Champions League, um, it's still very much in that oeuvre of uh, British teams letting you down in Europe when that was reliable. Rather than yeah, it's um it's a, it's a comforting time for me the early nineties. So we're talking about the European Cup rather than the Champions League, are we? Well, no. Now we're fully fledged into the Champions League era. Ninety four, ninety five is the first sort of um, I guess modern Champions League, which is strange to say that the the group stage is the semi finals for for three years essentially. It's the last eight, whereas the Champions League is flipped around in this season and it becomes 16 teams and the group stage happens first in four groups of four. And in Group A, we had Galatasaray of Turkey, uh, IFK Gothenburg from Sweden, uh, Barcelona from Spain and Manchester United. Tim is shaking I'm sorry. his yeah, finger. I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to pull you up on that one. I travelled back from a game the other day with a mate of mine who's a big Botafogo fan and a Swedish. Uh, he's Swedish. Uh, and I spent most of the journey saying, can you please say Gothenburg in, a, in, in the way that it, it is in Sweden? And it, it's it's Yeah, it as close enough. That's an approximation again for you, James. It's Yuteborg, yeah. But then, and the one thing to remember about Gothenburg or Yuteborg, Gothenburg or Yuteborg, as I say, is the Swedish equivalent of Liverpool. It really is because their accent is idiosyncratic, to say the least. <laughs> And they have the same sense of humour. Uh, I knew this bloke uh, from, he was from, he was either from the Faroe Islands or from Denmark, but he lived in Gothenburg with his wife and children. And he told me this joke, and I thought it was a proper Scouse joke, you know. It's, there's a place in Yutabori called Charing Cross, and that's what the locals call it. Uh, the colloquial term is Charing Cross for this uh, crossing. In, in Gothenburg, they've got trams as well. Uh, they've got beautiful trams, to be fair to them. And people use them, you know, quite a lot. So trams are really a very essential part of the landscape. Anyway, Charing Cross is where several different trams meet. And this woman, um, sadly, was crushed there. And to be crushed... She was crushed to death, sadly, as I say. But to be crushed is cross uh, sad in Swedish. So, and the name for an old woman, the colloquial term for an old woman is sharing. <laughs> <laughs> we shouldn't laugh, yeah. I know. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> that's, that's great. That's great. <laughs> huh? Anyway, let's get back to the Champions League, as you were saying, James. I mean, I mean, I mean, how to follow that? Um, so yeah, um, I'm I'm going to say it how I've ever ever said it. So it's Gothenburg, Galatasaray, it's Manchester United, and it's Barcelona. Um, and we're half we're sort of halfway through the group stage. The first it's not a leg, but the first game at Old Trafford, the it's United two, Barcelona two, sort of end to end, uh, very British style game. Lee Sharp scores a fantastic back heel to uh, lay on to to get a share of the spoils, and then two weeks later, United go to Barcelona, and I think about eleven million people sit down to watch it on ITV. Big expectation, 
you know, this is United in the Champions League. It's put Barcelona. You know, the last time they played was the 91 Cup Winners' Cup final. United won 2-1. United had just done the double the previous year. And it was one of the biggest footballing lessons I've ever seen handed out from one side to the other. Uh, Barcelona win 4-0 and Roy Keane says we were happy it was 4-0. They were <laughs> delighted it was 4-0. It was one of these moments that you sit down and go, wow. <laughs> you know, very much in the same sort of over, same sort of like, you know, like the 2014 semi-final or you know, Brazil, Brazil, Germany. You just sit back and go, I did not expect that. Although the the, the the there is this thing of the limitation on foreign players, isn't there, at this time? Meaning um, that the United side is different from the side that it might have been in normal normal circumstances? Y yes, uh, but that is rubbish, and I will come on to, <laughs> come on yeah. to explain why. <laughs> because, I mean, Ferguson, this is a year before Bosman, so there is this, the rule of which we colloquially knew as the free foreigner rule, but it's actually a five foreigner rule, as long as a couple of your foreign players have been playing in your league for long enough, which Irish and Scottish and Welsh players tended to do. So United were allowed to play five foreign players. Barcelona actually only had four in their team. Uh, Jordi Cruyff counted as one of the, because of growing up in Spain, counted as one of the sort of plus two foreigners. They had to leave out Georgie Hadji from their side. Yeah. United had to leave out Brian McClare. And they chose to leave out uh, Peter Schmeichel as well but I think it was one of these things where bad decision it, we, we, bad decision oh it was an awful it was a it was an awful it was an awful decision not that yeah um but um so you so see yeah, the the foreigner rule got blamed it's like, oh this isn't fair and and blah 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 and Ferguson says it himself when the Bosman ruling is passed in 95 he goes well he kind of says oh it's come a year too late for us we might have won the european cup in 90 in 94 if, if if we didn't have it and i think he's referring to 93 94 not this season but um it's absolute rubbish you know milan had six foreign players in 93 they're leaving out hullet uh you know like i say barcelona are leaving out Hadji. united are leaving out brian mcclair it's not the you know we weren't the uh, you know United weren't the only side who were limited by the, the foreign player rule. And as we could see, or as we came to see, as soon as you got rid of this rule, all the other bit, all the teams sort of, sat, uh, you know, they they just brought in foreign players. It didn't matter. The, you know, they would then go and change the construction of their sides accordingly. Uh, and that's kind of after this from Bosman is when you really get the modern era of the Champions League. Yeah, there's a few things going on, though, as well as the uh, three-stroke-five foreign player rule. Uh, United, and I think you're right, they chose to leave Peter Schmeichel out. Absolutely worst mistake with regards to this game. But crucially, the Barcelona scout, as I understand it, um, second-guessed that. He had informed his team uh, and, um, you know, Johan Cruyff in particular, that, look, they're going to leave Schmeichel out. And I don't know how he got that information, but once they had that information, they could then put a strategy together to, um, you know, uh, to, to succeed. But also, remember, um, Eric Cantona was suspended for this game, so he's in the stands watching this beside Peter Schmeichel, it would have made a huge difference if he was around because it seemed like, you know, from the highlights I saw that Manchester United didn't have much of an attack. We'll talk about the defence in a moment, which is real, really where the tragedy um, is around. But those two parts, the fact that the Barcelona uh, scout second-guessed what Manchester United would do with regards to Peter Schmeichel and the fact that Eric Cantona was missing for this did add to the complication, didn't it, for Manchester United? I, I think un undoubtedly, and you, you look at that scene of where they're both in the in in the stands, sat next to each other, sort of grimacing, watching their teammates flounder. It's sort of part pained and sort of part "I told you so." Um, and the, and maybe with 
Ferguson at the time, may, I mean, maybe he didn't quite realise what he had in Schmeichel in terms of somewhat, you know, not just a shot stopper, but a, but an organiser and, and a leader. Um, and you saw in this game just how deeper and deeper the defensive line dropped. And is that because Gary Walsh isn't screaming at them or is it because they don't have confidence in Gary Walsh? Um, who knows? But you know, you say like the scout the was aware that they were gonna that they were gonna make this move. The scout was more aware than Gary Walsh was that Gary Walsh was gonna play. Gary Walsh not finding out until and, and, until the until the day of. And it's one of these really interesting things I think with sort of early this sort of early period of Ferguson is because United are quite dominant in the league at this point. There's not much cause, I guess, for tactical innovation. Um, and he tries it in this game. He tries to put Nicky Butt on Guardiola, um, which actually works relative, relative, relatively well. But he's, I, I wonder if he's sort of that tactical muscle hadn't been flexed enough in Europe and there wasn't enough knowledge there because they'd gone out to Galatasaray the year before. Um, they'd, they'd not done well against Torpedo. You know, ever since 91, they hadn't really had a deep European campaign. And yeah, I just... I just don't think he knew quite what he had with Schmeichel yet there. And, you know, with that sort of, not just the ability he had as a goalkeeper, but how he commanded the rest of the defence and yeah, inspired when it really the rest was of the game. It, it was a game when they needed him, wasn't it? Yeah. They really needed his imposing presence. And there's only one that you can really pin on on Gary Walsh, one goal, which is a, it's an absolute howl. It's a shot that's straight at him. And he manages to, to let it through. But it is the vital second one that means the game is, has gone away from him. On the, on the tactical point, I think that just reinforces the age-old thing that there is no success without failure. You've got to learn on the way, haven't you? And, and United went through these European campaigns, failing and accumulating knowledge and then accumulating knowledge. And in the end, they, they get better. But this is the day when against absolute top class, they are really, really shown up. Why defensively, in front of Gary Walsh, why do you think it went so wrong? Age is a reason. That entire back, you know, Paul Parker is 30. He's not playing in, in, in the league at that time. Roy Keane's playing at right back for most of the league games, but he gets reshuffled into midfield. Bruce is 33. Pallister's 29. Irwin's 30. It's it's an old... Um, it's 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 an it's an old defence there, which you can say should give you experience, but they're not experienced of playing against the likes of Romario in his peak and Stoichkov at his peak, uh, and the, those sort of players who were very comfortable finding space and, and and not, you know, you know they were very comfortable against you know your Alan Shearer, your David Hurst, those number nines who wanted to yeah. lead lead the line. Um, and then I think there's another bit. Ferguson certainly has uh, some blame for Ince here. And this mm -hmm. is really the game where Ferguson and Ince fall out. And he's sold at the end of this season. Ferguson says that Ince didn't want to accept the limited role that he he prescribed for him for this game. And they have a huge bust up at half time because Ince is still trying to break forward. And Ferguson says he wants him just to sit. Um, and so, you know, there's a little bit of there of, you know, is it, personnel or is it people not adhering to the tactics but there's there's a huge there's a combination there i would say but those are the two things that i would you know, not being experienced against these type of strikers and if if you think you're playing paul links as a holding midfielder and he's breaking forward to try and join an attack because he thinks well you've only got mark hughes up there on up, up front on his own then you lose that shape and you you lose that discipline and, and that ferguson called him a bottler he just said he, he bottled this game there's, well, there is so much space in front of the back four, isn't there, for, mm. for Stoichkov and, and Homario to, to run at, at, at these angles that leave. This is, this is a huge game in the, in the career of Homario because, in a way, it's his last blast, in a way. And he, he wins the World Cup in 94. He's terrible in the final, as he, would, as he would admit, but he wins the World Cup. And he doesn't want to know anymore. That's it for him. It. Doesn't want to know. Won't train... He's a strange because I spent a whole decade watching him and having occasion run run-ins with him and something. He's a strange, strange person. Freud explains. We're not going to get it, get it, get it into it here, but there's some there's some Freudian explanation I think on on his campaign for revenge against the world. 
It's a good job I'm an expert on Sigmund Freud, but yeah, I'll come to that in a moment. <laughs> no, don't. Uh, and he, it, I've just been reading this this book by a, a Portuguese author on Cruyff, and he argues that Hamadi wasn't a success at Barcelona. And I've been thinking about that, and it's probably correct. Um, he did well in the Spanish league, and they got through to the final of the of the Champions League the year before. We got hammered by Milan, but he doesn't do it in the Champions League, and he's bought he's bought when they are champions of 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 Europe. So he's supposed to take them up, and he doesn't. And I think this has huge repercussions, because the close one of the closest thing I think we, we, we've seen to him since is is Sergio Aguero. And when Guardiola takes over at, at Man City, he is not gonna let. Aguero be, be Homario. You know, he buys Gabriel Jesus and straight he puts in Gabriel Jesus ahead of him. And he's sending out this message. Look, you've got you've got to contribute more, pal. You've got to work harder. Uh, and and he, he, he gets the best out of Aguero, not just as a goal poacher, but also as a, as a player. And I think part of that is his experience of playing with, with, with Homario, where for, for his undoubted genius, he is an absolute genius but he's a very strange person, quite selfish, very selfish person. He's not really interested. And he wasn't interested in football anymore in, uh, after this. I mean, he, he didn't do anything for Barcelona apart from this game. And then at this time, this is just after I've moved to Brazil. This, so I'm following this from, from, from afar. Brazil introduces this new currency, which is pegged artificially high. It's pegged more than the dollar. It absolutely screwed me when I, I wasn't prepared for it at all. It, it, it plunged me into poverty because I expected to come over here living like a king. And my money just wasn't going far at all because, you know, it was it was as expensive as London. I it was just eating my money. But he does his sums and he works out, hang on a minute. I can get paid the same going, going back home. Don't have to be here anymore. And he did. And he, he, he went back home, start of, start of 95. And I remember being in the crowd for his first game. And he was terrible. And you could see he just he just didn't care. He just wasn't interested. And he spent two years like that. He came back to Spain a little bit. And then he spent two years doing nothing. He'd still score goals because he's the natural talent is unbelievable. But 95, 96, nothing, nothing. But he's absolutely idolised. I remember once when, and because he don't, he won't train, he won't train. Uh, there was even a, 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 a comedy writer did a, did a did a song about it. You know, why bother training if I already know what to do? You know, in a in his uh, his uh, <laughs> type voice, which is, uh, uh, and and then what happens? The end of '96, back half of '96, Ronaldo's gone to Barcelona, and he's killing it. And because football's getting more globalized, the repercussions are bigger than anything that Romario did at Barcelona. And he thought, fuck this. And he came back. He, he, he was injured back half of 96. You could set your watch by it. As soon as he got cold, he would get injured. He would get, he would get mm. muscular in, injuries because he wouldn't bother training. But he's still absolutely idolised. I remember Flamengo winning a, it's a local title. And he's, he's walked off after 10 minutes pulling a muscle, which he always did when it was cold. Uh, and then they win. And at the end, the crowd invade the pitch and they're shouting, Romario, Romario. I'm thinking he's limped off after 10 minutes. <laughs> but he's just, that, that, that level of idolisation finished him, I think, as a player. Because he went back to a place where he didn't have to do anything apart from what he wanted. Uh, as I say, Ronaldo starts killing it. And he thinks, I'm not having this. So he came back in 97 and he was unbelievable again. He was just on it. He was fantastic. Uh, and so he gets back in the Brazil side and you get the pair of them together for a while. Um, and But it all ends in tears because he breaks down injured again on the eve of 1998. As soon as it gets cold in Brazil, he breaks down again. Uh, and, and he went through his life in Brazil accumulating useless goals. He, he hardly scored a goal of real consequence in all of that time. It's such a waste of unbelievable talent that he had, real talent. And when he was on it, as he clearly was for this game, him and Stoichkov together, wow, wow. And you do feel a bit sorry for, for Messrs. Bruce and Pallister because, as, 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 as James is saying, I don't think they'd come up against anything like this before. 
and it's 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 unique and they're right at the peak of their powers as well you've got you know Romario's obviously won the world cup in in 94 just a few months before but Stoichkov has got Bulgaria to the semi-finals you know one of the great sort of you know perhaps unremarked upon stories you know of, of, of 90s football that Bulgaria who typically nowadays don't even qualify for major tournaments we're we're semi-finalists and you can talk about Lechkov and you know some other good players that they have but that is on Stoichkov back and he is the sort of you know genie you know the sort of eastern sort of block genius that we were very used to at that sort of time those very cultured uh playmakers that um those countries tended to produce at those that time but he he was the best amongst them um and you know he had problems with work rate towards the end of his career he went and had a st stint in mls at chicago and he wasn't very good there but this at uh, this moment well, you know, i think, think he's been suspended Romario, for a year in bulgaria before he come over to Barcelona for like kicking a referee or something, you know, he was, he was an explosive figure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very much so. And I think he got into politics later on in life as well. And it's kind of, you know, so he's, he's some very, very passionate, very opinionated, uh, allegedly quite a, a high opinion of himself, but then you look at what he does on the pitch and perhaps justifiably so. Yeah, this match and all of this is something of a preamble just to remind listeners that what we do on the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast is look at an iconic match from some time in the footballing firmament, uh, focus on that primarily, but then look at the kind of soundtrack to accompany that that match, that moment, that time. Um, the 2nd of November 1994 is a match that we're talking about at Barcelona versus Manchester United. Uh, and what comes across, um, let's talk about the match for a moment, what comes across immediately is part of what you've been saying, that uh, both Gary Pallister and Steve Bruce look somewhat pedestrian, uh, taking on the thoroughbreds of, uh, at this point, of R Romario and Stoichkov. They don't look in the same class. Um, and you notice that from very early on in the match, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I can understand that uh, Roy Keane quip that, you know, we were grateful that it was only 4-0. Well, you, you, would, you would have thought that a midfield of Keane, Ince and Butt would have been able to give them a little bit of protection. That's a good point. That's a good point. So yeah. even before the defence, but the defence in the penalty area look particularly slapstick. It, it's, it, it's not great, but I mean, in their defense they haven't been playing together you know you know if you think of the defensive unit as you know not just the back four but the goalkeeper and the holding midfielder as as well this group never played together before nor since this is the first time they're put together in a cauldron of an atmosphere in the in in in, in the new hundred fourteen thousand, and, uh, and a, a huge state Paul Parker's not, like as I've mentioned before, is not playing. Roy Keane's the regular right back. Gary Neville's on the bench. And he's he also says it was the one time in his career he didn't want to get on. He never, he ne he never wanted to get on. He was very glad for so and after and after this game, Gary Neville's blooded. He's given he's given an opportunity. Uh and the the week after this, so on the weekend, this is like a Wednesday, Wednesday night. On the Saturday, Paul Scholes gets to start for the first time as well. Mm -hmm. I think this is almost a watershed moment of United when Ferguson realizes that 94 team, that double winning team, isn't gonna do it. And he makes the decision to renew the team. And we know where that goes. And I guess there's obviously so he knows what's coming through a little bit, you know, you know, obviously there's a bit of luck there in terms of those players going on to be how good they they were. But this is the moment when they're all sort of goes, what we're putting out, it's not going to work. And there's only three players who start this this evening who start the 99 Champions League final. So th there's others in, in the sort in, in the sort of periphery and some who, you know, so Gary Neville's on the bench and, and Skulls, you know, on the bench and they come into that. But only three of the starting lineup are there four and a half years later when United eventually get to the peak of Europe again. So it's such a pivotal game um, purely for the sort of the exposure of their weaknesses. And as Tim says, learning, learning through failure. Um and yeah, it's just it's so stark. And as also Tim mentioned as well, this Barcelona team, 
they're not the champions of Europe. They'd had their own sort of chastening experience yeah. six months before when they thought they were going to win another European Cup. And oh, AC Milan just absolutely just played them off the through park. Them. Walk yeah. through them. I remember sitting down to watch that game when, with a Barcelona scarf, thinking exhibition time. And just Milan walk through him. It was it was it was a massacre. Yeah. Did you see so, the scarf on? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and no, all, all the way to the end. To be fair, all the way to the end. But, but yeah, so that, so if if at this point we're thinking Milan are the best team in Europe, and they they humble Barcelona, Barcelona humbled United, and it's one of those sort of reality check moments where you've got to kind of look and go. Is this team good enough? And Ferguson concludes for most of them that they're not. Yeah, you describe this. Does, how quickly does defense defensive unit get replaced? So I don't think. Uh, I mean, I don't think Parker plays again for United. I could be. I could. I could be. I could be wrong. But he was sort of on the way out anyway. Bruce hangs on to the end of '96 in a, in, a, in a reduced role. Pallister, I think, stays one more seat. Pallister, Pallister, and Irwin, he still sort of has faith in. Bruce gets sort of turned into this club captain type figure. He'd already tried to, re he'd already brought David May in and David May misses this game through injury. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's a net, then Neville comes in at right back. So that's quite a big change. Ince is gone at the end of the year and Chelskis is gone at the end of the year, but that's not because he's not playing well. There's some, there's a lot of shadiness around why Andre Kanchelskis leaves, le le leaves United and that's covered plenty well online and people can read about that. Uh, I don't want to accidentally libel someone here. Um, so, so, uh, but there's, uh, but uh, so there's, yeah, it's it's relatively swift. And obviously, the big, check, you know, we talked we talked a little bit ago. Schmeichel comes back, and Schmeichel's then the constant. There's no sort of question. Whenever you know it, he's the almost the first name on the team sheet, uh, then throughout that period, and obviously he's the captain in the when they go on to win the um, Champions League in '99 too. Yeah, what about Barcelona? On. Sorry, sorry. Okay. So I think Bar Bar Barcelona, there's obviously, this is coming towards the end of the Cruyff era. They'd already started to renew a little bit beforehand. So Laudrup uh, moved on to Real Madrid in the summer previously. And that, again, as a sort of consequence of the free foreigner rule, he was left out of the of the, the 94 final. Uh, uh, Capello said, sort of the happiest ever made <laughs> ever made yeah. him because he feared that Laudrup would tear them apart and he was very happy with with uh with going up against uh, Romario and Stoichkov. Um but you know maybe a bit of gamesmanship. But so Barcelona are already in this sort of beginning to regenerate and Cruyff goes out, Robson comes in and you get that kind of um obviously Ronaldo coming coming from PSV to to Barcelona is huge in that. But you do get the the sort of the steadying influence and that constant influence of Guardiola throughout that runs right from the sort of 92 European Cup team up, and, up, up until he leaves at the early part of the 21st century. So it's a little bit more gradual for Barcelona. But of course, it takes them longer, actually, to then go and to go and win the Champions League by having that gradual uh, sort of performance. Um, because they had that they did sort of well, they got into the knockout stages this uh, of of this season, and perhaps by grabbing the bull by the horns like Ferguson was forced to, because he was confronted with his own inadequacies, maybe they got there. Well, they did get there sooner. So you know, there's an argument for for, for being radical at times like this. Yeah, you mentioned that, um, and I thought you aced that definition actually. That this was the, um, as far as you're concerned, the most sort of. Uh, or the the game that showed you, I can't remember the exact phrase, but you said that, you know, the match where you can see most clearly that, you know, one team has been schooled by the other, I think it was essentially what you were saying. Do you want to talk us through the goals then? Because there were four in all, all going <laughs> from one direction to the other, uh, or all going in the same direction. The first one was scored by Stoichkov. Yeah. Second by Romario. Yeah. yeah, so the uh, the Romario one was the one that Tim referenced, which was sort of the one that goes through uh, Gary, Gary Walsh's legs. Um, they were, they were, you look at them and you're... What am I trying to say here? There's almost a... 
there's an inevitability about about almost all of these goals. Their goal, their goals, the goals of pressure and um, sort of based on you know the controlling of possession and where you where you are on the pitch. It felt like for all, you know. I mean, the first goal goes in within the first 10 minutes, but it already felt like United had been scrambling for at least five minutes to keep Barcelona out at, the, at, at this point. And it's you know, obviously good strikers, nice, nice, nice finishes. But there's nothing there that makes you go, wow, there's nothing, there's nothing they could have really done about those. They were they were all sort of goals from sort of I would say pressure and, 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 and persistence. And I feel like on another night, you know, you could easily be looking at seven or eight. So many of them, I think, are a kind of homage to the, the diagonal ball. Yeah. Which is, uh, I remember being, I was at Wembley for 92 for the final. And it's the thing that really, really struck me, the way that Barcelona moved the ball. And it's all diagonal. I remember there was one lot, massive one, two, long-term one, two, but it was two diagonal passes. I thought, this is fabulous, this way of opening up space. And the first one is Jordi Cruyff cutting in and he finds a diagonal ball to Romario behind the line and Romario gets it back in, in into the box and it falls for, for a first time finish. But it's the diagonal stuff that has, that has undressed them. The second one, again, it's a long, it's, this one's a long diagonal ball in and Romario is, is able to control the ball on his chest in the penalty area. There's no way that United centre-back should be allowing him to do that. But once he's done that, then he's going to lead them on a quick step. No, then it, then it, then it's, it's a lesson in reduced space football speed, which is totally different from Usain Bolt speed. It's fainting to do one thing and then doing the other, and that gives you the vital half yard, and the shot. You know, and Neville uh, Gary Wolf should have should have swallowed it up because it, it it does go it does go straight through him. The third is is Stoichkov and and, Hom and Homario at pace running at pace, but again, it's kind of diagonal runs and, and the, def the defence are confused by it. And by the fourth, you're feeling sorry for them, aren't you? The fourth, I think, is is Ferrer cutting in from, from right back and he gets it back and it's just a left foot. You're, you're, you're right back lashing in a left foot shot into the, in, in, into the far top corner. That doesn't happen very often, does it? Not against that era of United team. And, you know, they, they were... They were sort of giving up, and it was, you know, I'm sure physically and emotionally they didn't feel like they were, but it was they they wanted it to end. They were, it was, it was, and, and the, the final whistle at this point was mercy. You know, it really, it really was. And you know, Albert for a fine player, but he's he's not someone who should be, you know, you should be worried about. You know, he's a functional player. He's not he's not someone who you should be you should be worrying about embarrassing one of your fullbacks. Yeah, there. You've already mentioned uh, about the United defenders trying to hold back the years, but as money's too tight to mention, could we talk about Mick Hucknall <laughs> and what he's got to do with this? Well, this this is also like a sign of professionalism as well. This is very much pre Wenger, isn't it? You know, can can, can you imagine Dolce and Gabbana being involved in a kickabout with with AC Milan the day before they played a big European game? <laughs> Absolutely not. You know they've got Mick Hucknall, who's in joining in with training the night before they played Barcelona in the new Camp. It's 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 just <laughs> look, just think, just <laughs> think about it in any other comp like why. Why is that happening? And there's no way that Ferguson would you get this impression of Ferguson as this no nonsense manager who doesn't tolerate this sort of stuff and he's old school. This is bonkers. <laughs> like what what is going through his head here? Well, what was going through my head was that Mick Hucknall mm. scored against <laughs> Gary Walsh. <laughs> that is just shocking, man. <laughs> That is shocking. No, I, I, I know. Um, I tried to put a goal past Shea Given. It ain't as easy <laughs> as you think it is, mate. It's not as easy. I did all the different <laughs> penalty spot shots I could. You know, I did it cleverly. I placed the ball. I, I whacked it with all my flipping energy. He just picked the balls out of the sky, <laughs> you know. Um, it's not easy. How on earth could Mick Hucknall... 
put a goal past the Man United goalkeeper who's going to be facing Barcelona the next day. That is shocking. <laughs> Just a bigger bit. I mean, Gary Walsh says, you know, says it when when he talks about this. He, that if the boss had boss had seen that, maybe he would have changed his maybe would have he'd changed his plan. But I I just genuinely don't blame Gary Walsh. It's just like, what's he even doing there? And and you know, it's just like it's just it's symptomatic of where English football was at the time, and that it had become attractive. Because of Italian ninety and everything like this, it had been become attractive to to pop culture, but football hadn't let yet developed and grown up and learned that there's times, you know, to keep it at arm's length. And I would certainly say, you know, the training pitch the night before a Champions League game might be one of might be one of those times. There's video from this where I don't know what they were doing because I can't find any evidence of it actually ever being published of of Ince and Hutnell and Ryan Giggs having a photo shoot on a bed in their hotel room in Barcelona. It's just like Are you yeah. are you saying are you saying, James, that Mick Hutton should have been denied this little bit of pleasure on the fairground? No, oh, yeah. Well I, I'm saying he's not a star. Is what I'm saying. No, <laughs> very yes. good, very good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's very good. On that note, <laughs> uh, should we talk about the uh, musical <laughs> soundtrack to this match on the second of November, nineteen? 19- 94. Uh, Mick Hutton, thankfully, <laughs> is not anywhere near it. <laughs> Otherwise, there'd be some more uh, puns throughout the day. But anyway, uh, yeah, let's go back to this. Anything caught your eye? You, you're a youngster of today. James, anything caught your eye from those days? Yes, the thing that caught my eye, I was super excited. I was going to get to go and look at a 1994 chart. I was expecting Britpop to be everywhere because we're it's told just, that. It's just too early. It's just yeah. too early. Yeah. It's just this is the beginning. This is yeah. the swing beat era. Ever heard of swing beat? God, no. Why would there. I have heard of that? <laughs> <laughs> good point. <laughs> Very good point. Very good point. No, Oops. so... so so I was expecting Britpop, and there's a little bit in there. You've got Oasis, has got you've got cigarettes and alcohol. Cigarettes and alcohol. Yeah. It's a great vocal. It, it, it's one for me that kind of almost defines their entry. The voice is different, isn't it? I think it's a great. I think it's, it's Liam's one of his finest performances because it stamps his identity on the situation. Uh, you know, it's. <laughs> It's it's a great performance. It's amazing because you've got so much of that almost the tropes around Oasis get defined in 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 the first few months of that that the, the, they're there. You've got this and you've also got Sunshine from 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 Live Forever, I think, as well. The way that they say sunshine. Shine. And and yeah. that so this is all <laughs> coming from definite definitely maybe. <laughs> And this is um, this is the I think the third or fourth single from the album, but it's the first one after the album comes out. So it's got the back. So it's um, the album came out in the October, and it, but it's there. It's but it's it's not doing anything really. It's, it's at thirty four in the chart, and so that's that's there. I wasn't. I mean, I was aware of Pato Banton, um, who's number one in the chart. I didn't realize this would be another chance for Tim to to break out his Brummy impression and talk about UB40 <laughs> though. <laughs> Which well, I know he loves to do. He, no, he loves to that. talk about Aston Villa and all, but Never let's put that obvious. to one side. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the interesting thing about Pato Banton being at number one with Baby Come Back is that this song was originally written by Eddie it's Grant. Eddie Grant, and it's Equals. Yeah, that's part of the Equals. And it went to number one already in what would it be, late 60s, early 70s? No, uh, mid-60s. It's earlier than you think. Mid-60s, okay. Yeah, yeah, Equals earlier than you think. And the Equals was, they're called the Equals because they were the first sort of like multiracial band really to come out of uh, Britain, Eddie Grant being from the Caribbean initially from Guyana, although he went back, returned to, I did the last interview with Eddie Grant before he left Britain to return <clears throat> to the Caribbean, but he went and set up a recording studio in Barbados because Guyana, nobody's going to fly out there, the Rolling Stones people like that, Mick Jagger, who have used his studio in Barbados, so they were never going to fly out to Guyana. So he set up the studio in Barbados, which is probably uh, more to the um, liking of um, somebody coming from Britain wanting a quiet life in the Caribbean, because Guyana is much more kind of, uh, you know, real than Barbados, is how I would put it. In any case, Baby Come Back, 
this version is virtually shit actually uh compared it's, it's to a horrible original. kind of pop reggae isn't it it's yeah it's it's, it's a weak. ub 40 reggae isn't it it's coming it's the birmingham reggae experience that pato banton's uh, been um part of uh pato came onto the scene uh he wasn't the best uh, reggae mc to come out of birmingham uh probably the funniest is a guy called maccabee who is just hilarious but hasn't really changed his style in several years, in my view. But Pato Banton came out of the sound systems of Birmingham, where there were quite a few biggies. And he had a song called Hello Tosh, I'm a Toshiba. Uh, big, probably number one in the reggae charts, but, you know, it wasn't quite the official charts. And here, I'm pretty sure he's teamed up with UB40 on this one, is how mm. I remember it, uh, to do a cover of uh, the Eddie Grant original or the Equals original. But it's like I say, virtually shit. I don't want to say shit because, you know, he's trying a thing, but yeah, it shouldn't be at number one. Um, Always by Bon Jovi at number two, I think is a better shout Fucking for number one. I hate it. Hate really? it. Really? Hate it. I, think I just he's... can't see the point. Uh, I'm not a rock fan anyway. And for me, it wasn't very interesting the first time around. But like the Bon Jovi and what's it? Guns and fucking roses. I just can't no, see the you point. Can't not you know, guns and just, roses. I, I can, I, I, yeah, I can. No. I will. It's all <laughs> been done before, and it's all been done better before. Yeah. And it's just some horrible retread for high school American white kids. Yeah, I you say hate that. It. I, Look, the singing ain't brilliant because he comes from the rock tradition. Is not brilliant at singing a ballad. I Sounds just, like... I'm I, I honestly baffled by the success of this. Yeah, I'm not because it's a great song. Uh, what about you, James? It's it's a little bit schmaltzy for me. It's um okay. it's got that it's it, I suppose it's very symptomatic of the age. It's almost like uh it's almost like Pepsi Max and not Pepsi, or it's your it's <laughs> it's your Diet Coke versions of and look, I think it's a, a real, well written song. It comes into this sort of I would I wouldn't I, I Tim bad mad Guns and Roses last time I was on and I wasn't gonna oh, see that He's then again, but this yeah. is well this is sort of air, this is sort of like 90s Aerosmith as well, and it's kind yeah, of going yeah, for those yeah. sort of biggish sort of slow hooks. Don't it's not, it. not for me. I'll but if you, you want original, Tim, you've got Wigfield Saturday Night. No, no, that's three. rubbish. He's only joking when <laughs> yeah. he says that. I'll tell you, number four. Yeah, I quite like the duck in that. I just got get to duck, the duck. Just going quack, 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 oh, quack right, all the way through I it. That. I quite, do quite like that. That's the Malcolm McLaren thing, isn't it? Duck, duck. No. No, it's not. No. It's it, it, it's it's a Euro techno because yeah, yeah, there's a, there's a few yeah. things going on there. One of the things you mentioned there was a swing beat. Mm -hmm. uh, another another thing is We're is that Euro that. Euro kind of techno thing. It's kind yeah, of yeah. dance music for people with no rhythm. Bang 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 bang. Techno it's... techno techno techno. It's like the two untalented <laughs> only with less talent. <laughs> Very good. At number four, number five, um, we'll come on to the problem with number five in a second, but you've got the swing beaters in there. Michelle Gell, who came out of EastEnders. Um, and I, the reason why I wanted to mention this is my cousin, I've got a cousin who's married to uh, a TV star. Yeah. And so they have a, or they had anyway this year, like New Year's Eve party. It was really good, to be fair, at their house. And Michelle Gale comes along and there's a part of uh, the uh, New Year's Eve party where everybody's doing sort of karaoke. So she does a karaoke of this song, which is her best song, her biggest hit. But I'll give you this. The crowd at the party, there's a private house party, was so diverse. And yet you had all the women singing along to this they knew the lyrics off by heart she didn't have to do very much singing because they were doing it a cappella so it makes you think that the, the the song stuck she's doing it in an american swing beat way um and it doesn't quite i always feel uneasy when a uk person's doing something that's quintessentially american like swing beat but i think she does it all right she's got that vibe is the if you like authentic American swing beat, but R. Kelly is the problem for mm. nowadays listeners. Yeah. Yeah. So that's your top 10 there. Uh, which, oh, we've got the cover of Girls They Want, the Girls Just Want to Have Fun by Cindy Lauper covering her own song, I suppose. What, what, what yeah. about um, Supergrass? I was thinking about you, James, My when I was listening to this. Because again, th this is, this is Britpop being born. Isn't it? 
cool yeah. butter fuzz. It's it's young and it's it, it's irreverent. Uh, and like Oasis, I think it speaks to the experience of a of a generation, a generation that are all that are all already getting heavily involved with hedonism. Uh, and it, it there's a there's a punk spirit about about the whole thing, and it tells it tells a little story, and it's very much the story of a of a teenager. Were you were you down with the kids? Thing is, I wasn't getting this at the time. I was sort of backfilling this when I became more aware aware of those bands, probably ninety six, ninety seven, and then trying to kind of you know, either getting records off people's older brothers or stuff like that. And it's kind of picking this up. This would have been for me, 94, this is, I would have been in year six at school. So this is, I'm 10. Uh, so this, this is the school dance era, era and where I can remember almost everything that I went to from the age of 10 to 13 finished with a rendition of Wigfield Saturday Night. So <laughs> I'll leave her now. For the, that's, what I, that's what I'm getting. And I'm having to go and... Go, go and sort of <laughs> understand this. For me, Britpop really sort of kicks off in the summer of 95, yeah. when you get that big, when it becomes front page news, Blur versus Oasis and the battle for the album charts around what's the story, Morning Glory. You're right. And, You're right. And all, all of that stuff. So it's not, I'm not getting it quite at the, quite, quite no. at the time here. But you can see this chart and there's some bands. And if you look at, you know, I, I shouldn't, I looked ahead a week and there's some Shed Seven that's a new, you know, there's, there's those bands that I'm starting to sort of recognize from that era popping up here. Um, and so, yeah, it, it feels a little bit like, I don't know, like, the you know, there's there's always evolution in the charts, but it it does feel like the start of sort of my music coming in, even though I didn't really know it was my music at, at this point. I, I, I hate to name drop, but uh, my missus was a backing singer for Supergrass and she tells me that You're they joking. were very... Yeah, no, it's true. Um, and she tells me, she's not on this track, but she tells me that... Um, I should hope not too. Respectable, respectable <laughs> exactly. lady. Well, this is the thing. They're very respectable, uh, respectable boys. Are uh, they? Sons, yeah, sons of GPs, I think it was, and from Cambridge or Oxford or something like that. Yeah, very middle class boys, which I think goes back to what James was just saying about the Britpop era. If you look at that, and you're absolutely right, it was at the point when suddenly Oasis and Blur were on the nine o'clock news. And they were doing a feature about this rivalry, who was going to be number one out of the two of them. That's when you realise, shit, something's happening here. And around about that time, they got invited, or at least Oasis did, to um, uh, to Downing Street when Tony Blair was prime minister. And then you realise, oh, shit, I've missed it already. If the prime minister's on it, I've missed it completely. But that If rivalry... the prime minister's on it, that means it's already gone. Exactly, exactly. Um, so, but that rivalry between Oasis and Blur shows the uh, middle class, working class divide of Britpop. There were two sides to it. You know, when you start getting art students, like, and they're, you know, great songs, but, you know, people like Jarvis Cocker, etc., were a little bit more middle class than Oasis. It's kind of like the Rolling Stones, Beatles thing that was, and I think that wasn't lost on the... Um, news bulletins it's at number 63 that caught by the fuzz by supergrass below that 64 is a brilliant track by nanny cherry use door called <clears throat> seven seconds i think Huge it was a, a, over here well, well i'll tell you what just when you look at those that chart caught by the fuzz by supergrass number 63 number 64 use and door and nanny cherry by seven seconds out um, you know, somewhat overshadowed by Space Cowboy by Jamiroquai, which was another amazing track out of nowhere. Yeah. But the one that really gets me is at number 66, Incredible, M Beat featuring General Levy. This is your standout uh, drum and bass track. I've seen General Levy perform it many times now because he tends to be on this kind of like festivals that my missus is invited to. So I get to see him perform it. This, if you listen carefully, it's already in there, but this is a flipping drum and bass opera. There are so many musical movements in this one track. And, you know, um, 
the engineer that works with uh, my missus uh, the most daily, he produced this. And he tells me, or he engineered it. He tells me, you know, the producer for this track that has survived 20 or 30 years now, it was like a 15 year old schoolboy used to come into the studio in his school uniform to produce mm -hmm. this track. Isn't that an amazing story? That is how music evolved. Yeah, into... it doesn't surprise me at all. The, the cutting edge becomes the technology, becomes almost like the techno nerd. So in, in, in counterpoint to that, there's one that we haven't spoken about yet, which I think stands out as, as perhaps the masterpiece of this one. And it's not my stuff at all. And it's not an English thing at all, which is the reason I, I, I can't get it. But I do find it absolutely enchanting in the way that it creates a mood. And that's Sheryl Crow. All I want to do yeah. is have oh, some fun. Oh, I agree with you. Oh, I agree with you. I think it's I a agree. masterpiece. I think, I think it's, yeah. you know, and as I, it's not my stuff at all, which makes me accept it as a, as a masterpiece. Because if, if this comes on, I want to listen to the story that she's telling. Yeah. yeah. She's got... it, it's, it's one of those that just feels like it's, it's got a timeless feeling to it. And I remember I was at the, I don't know which, it would have been Glastonbury a few years ago. I don't think she was doing the legend slot, but she was doing pyramid stage, sort of middle of the afternoon. Sun was shining. You hear that. And I'm not in control of where I'm walking now. I'm just, I'm, I was supposed to be walking past. And now I'm walking towards the pyramid stage. And I'm just going to get a Sheryl Crow greatest hits uh, set because oh, it's brilliant, especially out in such a, it's, it's a mood. It's a lovely mood and you can mm. just lose yourself in it. It's great. Yeah, she's got one of those voices that tells stories in any case, mm. and she's got a little bit of um, cynicism about her vocal, and she rocks. Um, she was one that did that, um, that don't impress me. So you're a rocket scientist. Oh, no, it wasn't. I'm confused. That's Shania that. Twain. Well, thank you for the <laughs> difference there. But they're not dissimilar in style, I suppose. And they both chicks playing guitar as well, as I remember, yeah? Well, if you want to talk about really rocking women who are sort of great front people, and I think this is a love, there's it's lower in the charts. I think it's in the fifties, uh, but they're in Zombie by the Cranberries. Oh yeah, and yeah. they, uh, Dolores Reardon, it's a site. They were another of those sort of nineties sort uh, sort of bands that, that I feel is sort of a little bit of ownership from, even though they're from Ireland, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't think I understood what Zombie was about at the time, um, which is incredibly political song about, I think, the an IRA bombing. I don't want to get this wrong, but I think it's the Warrington bombing. Um, it's about the sort of futility and pointlessness of the conflict that had been going on there. And to have this sort of excoriating voice come from a, a young female voice as well, sort of essentially just chastising a generation of older men for what they've been doing to, like, their community and their country and having that just rip through music i think it was so powerful and it's obviously changed and it's taken on meaning throughout the years i mean recently it was the sort of anthem of ireland during um the rugby world cup and you've got eighty thousand irish in the stade de france all singing zombie after they beat mm. south africa but this is where this comes through and you know the cranberries and you know she's sadly no longer with us but you know what a talent and what a voice on that song Mm, fascinating. Is, I'll, I'll, I'm going to go back to that and listen to that. Yeah, this is for the me, chart, though. Because, sorry, for me, the, the spirit of of the time for me is, and I'm not saying this as a fan of it at all, but just sums up the time is Corona, rhythm of the night. Mm. Mm. Yeah, uh, and th th there's a lot of stuff like that. There's you know Rosala who had she's in the charts as well. You know, everyone's free to feel good. She's not in the charts with that one. She's in, in um, you never love the same way twice. That for me, if, if I shut my eyes and transport myself back to that time, and what what I just remember being around me, uh, it's 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 that kind of Euro that snapper in the charts, you know, I mean th that kind of Euro thumpity 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 thump. This is the chart. Well, it's not the chart of this track, but it is the era of this track. Uh, whether you want to accept it or not. Love is all around, wet, 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 had been in the charts at this point for 25 weeks. 
for six wow. months, half of the year. It's on its way down at uh, number 46. Is, is that connected to a film or something? Is yes, that, it was. Right. That's how it's, these yeah. things started happening. What was it? It was um, four weddings. Four, four weddings. And um, it's. I love the fact that Hugh Grant left the country and wanted to hide when that came out. <laughs> despised it, it so much, although it made his yeah. name, you know, just yeah. despised yeah. it. But, but you what know where he about... ended up. You know where yeah. he what ended up. Indeed, right? indeed, yeah. yes. Yeah. What do we think about Tom Jones? Because I, I think Tom Jones is one of the greatest vocalists these islands of 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 Yeah, yeah. And but I just think his career right the, he, he's trying to be kind of a little bit cutting edge you know, in, a, in an ironic way. Mm -hmm. But I, I just wonder in Tom Jones, like through the late sixties and seventies. Had he not taken the Vegas route, had he stayed truer oh, to the things that, that he loved yeah. and got him into it at the start, the yeah. body of work that Tom Jones could have come up with. Yeah, I think you have a point. Sorry, you go ahead, James. You go ahead. Do you want I was to just going to say, Tom Jones was, for me growing up, it was almost a bit of a punchline. You know, it's kind of, he, he, he almost made himself out become like not serious in, in 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 the culture he'd left and he certainly if you compare like someone you know tom jones vocally compared to someone like max boyce max boyce is beloved in wales you know because because, because of his authenticity and the fact that he stayed grounded in there and yeah people will like tom jones's music if you, you know if that's your if that's your thing but i find it i yeah i just he just seemed to you see, and the tan, the tan is the tan is a problem. Well, for me. yeah, you know, that's so a much a... more recent addition. The tan, <laughs> no, the, the, the tan can... can never be a problem. See, one of my, rem <laughs> my memories of coming back in '95, the first time I came back, just for a, a few weeks or so, and uh, people saying, "You don't half look like Noel Gallagher." But you didn't get that tan in Manchester, did you? <laughs> <laughs> so if the tan is separating me from Noel Gallagher, with all due respect. Then... Okay. The track with Tom Jones that we're talking about is number tw at number 22. It's If I Only Knew, where he really does rip out the vocals like he's wont to do. But I think Tim has got a point in that. He's a great blues singer. He's a fabulous, fabulous blues he, singer. He wow. does the album a few years later, duets, which I think does give him some sort of kudos and credo and and and, and some some clout again. And and that he does that one with the it, cardigans and it, yeah, yeah, that was the one that he did um, with Keris Matthews, wasn't it? Keris Matthews. Yes. Yeah. Is that. Um, look, I, I think that underlines Tim's point that. Tom Jones tries to be contemporary by latching onto these things, but none of it kind of works. None of it is on the level of, you know, it's not unusual. Um, when you have a track that big, that massive, and remember when they first launched him in the States, they made sure that they didn't put his picture on the cover of the singles yeah. or the album because... As black. far as they could hear, yeah, his voice was yeah. black. And, you know, my missus has worked with Tom Jones yet again, another well one dropped. for my missus. Well dropped. And she, no, no, this is a true story. She, she is the, the missing link between Tom Jones and Supergrass. This is unbelievable. <laughs> she is, she is. But she and you are now going to Supergrass me. anything on Tom Jones. <laughs> exactly, exactly. She tells me that he's got a little black in him. And, oh, you know, don't she, doubt it for a minute. Exactly. This is, we're talking about the Cardiff Tiger Bay experience in any case, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. But she said, you know, she looked at his hair and, you know, you know, we have our, you know, kinks in our hair. And she looked a bit at the back of his neck mm -hmm. sort of thing. And she said, oh, yeah, no, he's definitely got some black in him. Mm -hmm. And that's what they thought in the States when they heard his voice. So they thought, oh, we better market him to the black audience in those yeah, days. Yeah, but American... I wish they'd done, done that more instead of so much of the schlock. Well, he, he should did, have you know, done... The last vague Vegas, the well, man and a half he, and the, you know, he should have I agree with you, although I can see why he did it. Uh, it brought Elvis back into live concerts, seeing Tom Jones do Elvis essentially in Las yeah. Vegas. But um, or at least it showed Elvis the route maps of how to get into Las Vegas and re, you know, re rekindle his career. If Tom Jones had done a um, Dusty Springfield and gone to Muscle Shoals, um, which was Stack Studio, to record a Southern Soul album. 
Yeah, I think you're right. You would have had an icon. Yeah, although icon. when that didn't work, really work for Dusty commercially, you know, and she Maybe went down not, a hole but, afterwards. Oh, which is probably why Tom Jones didn't but, do it. You know, but you see, you're talking about commercially though. Yeah, remember, yeah. that's her most iconic album. Sure. You know, there's no uh, Dusty sings Memphis or whatever it's called. That's the one that you look at. You're comparing that to Aretha Franklin going down to Muscle Shoals, etc. There's there's and, always that thing in it. You, you you chase the money or or, or do you chase do you chase the art. You got to chase the art if you're Tom Jones because the people so. that you're chasing are Otis Redding and Otis Redding. You, you know, if you're Tom Jones, you're never going to go hungry, are you? If you do the right songs, yeah. If you well, choose no, the right if songs. you're never going to go hungry because you got a talent. Yeah, and I think that yeah. that gives you the freedom to do what you want to do rather than do what you think is the best commercially. Well, he didn't have the right advice because I, I would have gone down and done a sort of a Muscle Shoals album, done an album of a mix of soul classics and yeah. new, newly written and soul. Sung the hell out of him, he would have done. Yeah, it would have been fantastic. He would have. And it would just be re regarded in a different way because the musicians around him, you're using wow. the Stax musicians that Otis Redding used. Well, you can't go wrong with that. Anyway, that's my feeling about that. Listen, we guys, agree. we've got to bring this one to an end. It's been absolutely fascinating talking about the 2nd of November 1994 where Manchester United <clears throat> went to Barcelona to get thrashed. Um, as you said, James, this is a lesson. This is a masterclass and from one side and a shocking, shocking, shocking back of the class uh, dunce hat and all for the other side. And I'm sure there's an extremely good account of this game put in the context of everything that's happened to European football in your book, James, that you now have an opportunity to plug. Well, there's not an account of this game in my uh, it in my book and there's a there's, a, there's an error on my uh, on my part there but my uh, first book is uh, still available and covers the build up to this uh time period and also subsequently what happened what happened afterwards it's uh, the fix how the first champions league was won and why we all lost thank you tim <laughs> that was better than an approximation <clears throat> uh, you say your first book well, I did, I did, I did a rugby book, which I know you guys don't really uh, acknowledge as, a, as, a, as, a, as a sport. But I did, I did another book called World in Union, which is about the history of uh, the rugby world, the Rugby World Cup in fifteen matches, actually. Oh. Um, you're covering off. There's so much politics. I, I didn't realize. I thought I was writing a rugby book, and I ended up writing a political book. Um, you know the. The foundation of the Rugby World Cup is tied up with amateurism, commercialism, and of course, apartheid. Uh, you know, it only happens because South Africa are banned from playing New Zealand and Australia and they, and they need another revenue stream. So they come up with this idea that's been around in football since 1930 of having a World Cup. Um, and eight years later, it causes the game to go open and go professional. And, you know, it's become the third or fourth biggest sporting event in the world. All because, you know, a few people had the moral courage to stand up to apartheid South Africa in a sport which traditionally didn't have a lot of moral courage. How much aftershave did you have to drink for research purposes? <laughs> I think you'll find that the stories of rugby clubs uh, initiations are... Uh, are somewhat exaggerated for the benefit of the part of the supposed participants themselves. I think they, uh, you know, they uh, they get the stories get more legendary and greater mm -hmm. over time. But I, I'm I'm happy to neck a pint of Guinness with with anybody. <laughs> but you do have to drop your pants, though, don't you? Oh yeah, but why wouldn't you want to? <laughs> <laughs> they think it's all over. Oh, it is now. <laughs>